Right. Uh, welcome everyone to another Hustlers online meetup. Um, a few announcements before we get started. First, uh, we're always looking for speakers who would like to present at one of these meetups. If you have uh, some Haskell related uh, project that you find interesting and would like to share, then please let us know. Get in touch either on meetup.com or on Slack. Uh, second, the Hustlers meetup is organized by the Zurich Friends of Haskell Association, which also organized Zurich Act. If you're interested in supporting the Haskell community in Zurich, then uh, take a look at zfoh.ch and consider signing up. Um, and that's all for the announcements. With that out of the way, it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Simon Michael, who will uh, tell us about H Leisure. Over to you, Simon. Thanks, Andreas. Thanks, everyone, for uh, inviting me. Glad to be here. Um, now I can't see everyone. I was going to ask who's who's heard of Ledger, who's used Ledger, who's a Haskell developer. I, th I think most of you are Haskellers, obviously, from the name of the group. So uh, we'll just jump in. I have a little bit of a slide deck here. So let's just have a look over here. And I'm going to share that screen. And I guess I'll hide this Zoom. So bear with me. Here we go. Come on, Zoom. Mm -hmm. OK. Can you see my screen? I think you can. Yes, we can. Yeah, we can Thanks. see. Thanks. All right. So I, I aim to go a little bit under the covers with HLedger this time. Uh, I haven't spoken about that before or um, presented on it. So we'll see how we go. But first, a little bit of intro. Uh, so I'm a software consultant developer. Been doing it for a good long time. Uh, started in 1991, I guess, as an embedded systems uh, C programmer, building routers and stuff. and kind of transitioned into the web and got into scripting languages, Perl, Python, and then eventually Haskell. So uh, I've been doing Haskell about, about as long as I've been doing HLedger, which is about 14 years. Uh, we just turned 14 in uh, January of this year. And uh, prior to that was a big Python project. And that was part of what gave me the impetus to try out Haskell was uh, trying to maintain a big a big Python code base and, and deal with API changes and dependency changes and runtime errors, basically. And I wanted to explore Haskell partly as a strategic investment uh, for my career, you know, knowledge that would last a bit longer. And uh, also just to see how it would be as a as a tool for maintaining larger systems. And uh, so we'll get into that a little more. Um, we'll do a little intro to plain text accounting in H Ledger. Uh, you can slow me down if, if I don't do enough of that, but I think probably a bunch of you are familiar with that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about architecture and uh, history, and then we'll hopefully get into some practical stuff like um, a little bit of scripting, coding, troubleshooting. OK. Uh, plain text accounting. Uh, so this side here, uh, I put together to kind of unify some of the communities which were started by a tool called Ledger, invented by uh, John Weigley. H Ledger it was kind of the next clone of that, then Bean Count. Those are the big three, and then there's all these others, and there's all kinds of info about it at this site and. Basically, accounting is useful if you want to keep track of time, money, um, money especially. And uh, for a lot of us, this is this is an important thing. Uh, for me, it certainly was. I had a lot of financial stress at times in my life and kind of struggled with different accounting programs and systems. Uh, usually there would be bugs and I would get stressed and I wanted something that was dependable. And when I found Ledger, uh, it really suited me as a programmer and techie uh, being based on 
plain text and being amenable to uh, revision control so that you could always be sure what had changed and that your data was still good, even if you tried something new. And so um, we'll get more into that. Uh, here we go. So Ledger started in 2003. I used it for a while. I really liked it uh, initially for time logging for my for my work and then later for financial stuff. And I started HLedger about, uh, tried not to, but uh, after a while, couldn't resist it. Uh, started in 2007, uh, and then Bean Count is the other big big one that you may have heard of. And these are uh, similar in concept, all inspired by Ledger and uh, somewhat interchangeable. With a little effort, you can move your data between them. Uh, so essentially what comes with Ledger is a couple of tools, uh, file formats, which are kind of reasonably well specified, uh, and documentation for doing accounting with plain text. And uh, I think probably because you're all Haskellers, you, you probably are reasonably comfortable with the idea of using plain text as a, as a format for accounting. Basically, you know, the big advantage is you can revision control it so there's great transparency and auditability and uh, and kind of um, also future proofness so you can be pretty sure that uh, even if you can't run the software uh, 20 years from now you can figure it out from the plain text you can you can write a parser or you can just even read it yourself and, and uh, know what the data was each ledger, uh, I said 15, it's actually been 14. So it's a little bit better. Uh, so it's a, a long, my longest FOSS project so far. And uh, kind of slow progress, you might say, but uh, I like to think uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So it's kind of uh, growing slowly, but hopefully in a, in a sustainable way. And um, hopefully no major setbacks and wrong turns along the way. So at this point, 134 code contributors, which is a lot. Um, chat channel is typically around 80 to 100. Uh, I get I get plenty of happy feedback and I use it every week. Uh, uh, certain times it's been every day. Right now it's not every day, but every certainly multiple times a week. Um, I did have a goal of it being unlike my previous project, uh, quite moderate in, in time so that I could do other stuff and it would be have some kind of financial sustaining model. Not quite there yet, but little steps in that direction. Um, but every time I thought about, you know, how to make it more financially self-sustaining, it, it, it seemed like it would be if, if I were to give up the pure FOSS nature that would kind of kill the project. So it has stayed a pure FOSS project, which, which, uh, which I think is for the best. Uh, I wanted to make an end user application and there were not, and still aren't too many of those in Haskell. Uh, Pandoc is the most well-known and it's been kind of an inspiration. And there are some others now, especially with, uh, on the web, there are, there are a bunch uh, or a couple at least. Um, there are a bunch of tools, but a lot of them are programmer uh, oriented. And I wanted to make something that was uh, more for general with a more broad user base, uh, potentially. So I wanted it to be easy to install. Uh, number one thing for me, I wanted it to be dependable so that when I was stressing about finances, uh, I wouldn't have extra stress about the tool, you know, that it wouldn't work or that it might crash or that it might corrupt my data. Or, or even just, and I may be a little atypical here, but if it were making me think too hard or look up the docs too often, that would be a distraction. And I wanted to uh, avoid that and I wanted to enjoy it. I wanted it to, to be fun to use and pleasant because I didn't really enjoy doing accounting, um, especially back then it was pretty stressful and I wanted something that was fun and engaging and, um, Back to other people, I wanted to work on all major platforms, at least Windows, Mac, and Unix. 
because uh, you know if I'm going to put in all this work, I want it to be hopefully successful if possible. And I think being cross-platform is an important part of that, so that uh, you know a tool that you don't have to worry about does it run on my platform is is going to be more useful to more people. And I wanted it to be useful again to a broader group if possible. So no reason it should be only for programmers or only for even power users. You know, it should be useful to people who have financial issues. Uh, that was kind of part of the vision. So and there's a little bit of, you know, it is mostly still oriented at techies, but but there is a non command line UI, the web interface, which uh, does make it accessible to less technical folks too. Um, so the tools that I mentioned, there's there's three official ones. So the main thing is the command line interface. Then we've got a cursor style, uh, full terminal interface. Then we've got the web interface. And then these are some add-ons that uh, people have made. Uh, this is a more interactive data entry tool. And this is for generating uh, interest transactions according to certain interest schemes. And there have been a few others, uh, but these are the kind of production ready ones uh, right now. And the file formats, uh, journal is kind of the, the main one. And this is, um, surely we can quickly see one of those. Uh, looks like this. Uh, just dated entries with, uh, you know, account that money went to and an account that money came from. And these are hierarchic, so you'll see how that works in a bit. Um, so let's get back to presentation. This always trips me up. It's over here. So uh, that's the main format. And then we have um, some special support for CSV, which is kind of, at least in the US, the lowest con common denominator for getting data out of banks. The only one you can kind of rely on. And so we have special support for converting that into, into journal format. And then these are some formats that Ledger provided. So we also do, and uh, there are two, two versions of time logging. Uh, I use this one quite a bit. And it looks like I typically have it running up here in a drop down window. And I can put in, you know, a date and then a just make count name. I use dots this time. And each dot represents a quarter hour. So it's like a really quick, approximate, retroactively. Uh, you know, I can come back if I forgot to log, I can put in a few dots. And it's also kind of visual, so you can see. So, you know, here's some stuff from recently. So, um, those are the four formats that we support right now, and it's easy to add others uh, uh, should, should we have the desire. And documentation was super important to me. Um, Ledger and Beancout both have great docs, uh, but in both cases, as a Ledger user, I was missing, um, you know, sometimes you'd go to use a feature, maybe a niche feature or a, or a kind of a corner case of a main feature and you, maybe it wouldn't be documented or the docs would be out of date or there would be different versions of the docs. And so it was important to me to, um, that the docs would be complete, everything in the tool would be documented and everything in the docs would be, you know, accurately reflected in, in the tool. So, Reference docs are the kind of priority. So we have manual, uh, you know, Unix style manual. And, uh, but also, of course, there is introductory docs, there's some tutorials, there's some cookbook docs with practical recipes and some dev docs. Um, these are always a work in progress, of course. Um, but the reference docs are complete and uh, pretty accurate. So that's, that's been uh, one of the goals. And, uh, just to give you an idea what that looks like. Current incarnation of the docs, we're using MD book, uh, which is uh, like Sphinx, but but a bit simpler and a lot faster to run. And uh, we've got introductory stuff here, reference stuff here. And this is really where the core documentation is, the HLedger manual. Uh, and this is for the current release, 121. Uh, 
and you can see there's we talk about the CLI, we talk about the kind of general concepts, uh, and then we get into the commands. These are all subcommands of the CLI. And finally, we get into each of the formats. So this one manual, it's quite big. Uh, it used to be in separate pieces, but it turns out to be better overall to combine this one into one doc. And then of course we have some extra ones for the UI, which looks a little bit like that. And the web interface, which looks a little bit like that. And then we got all the cookbook stuff down here and the dev stuff down here. So we'll get more into that uh, right now, actually, because we're going to go into architecture and code. Before I do, uh, so far, so good. Any questions at this point? If we're good, I will continue. Okay, cool. Uh, over here. This is the same readme that you would see over on GitHub. This is the uh, GitHub project. And um, here it's a little bigger. That's just the intro. Uh, also for you uh, technical folks, if you are ever getting started, this is a quick way. Uh, the quick start summarizes stuff in a more bare bones manner and uh, gets you started fast. Uh, because there are quite a lot of docs, they do pile up over the years. And uh, it's a challenge actually keeping keeping them to just, just enough, but just the right docs. Um, we got some great sponsors down here. I'm going to thank them right now in case I forget to. And of course, we have many contributors, which uh, hopefully I'll show at the end. Um, so the main dev docs are this, the contributing guide. And there's, there's quite a bit in here. This is not updated too often, so it's not super up to date, but it does have a lot of useful info for anyone wanting to get into contributing or just understanding how each ledger is put together. Uh, and this talk, I, it shouldn't be just about each ledger. Uh, it's it's kind of general for Haskell apps too, especially uh, end user apps. But uh, I'll just quickly quickly run through just to give you an idea of the project layout. This hasn't been fixed up since I switched to MD doc, so it's too wide, but there's a bunch of useful links uh, and stats. We've got uh, four main packages is the word. And, oh, that's not the one. Uh, this is the one over here, package. These are reverse dependencies. So we've got the hledger -lib, H lib package, which um, is kind of the reusable main data types and reports and utilities, which are used by the three uh, user interfaces. Uh, hledger is the command line. Uh, it exposes some stuff too. Uh, just in case, uh, some of it is reused, like these option, the option parsing that is used by the uh, UI and by the web uh, interfaces too. So we'll come back to those. Um, yeah, maybe just backtracking project goals as a Ledger user. Uh, I wanted a version of Ledger, basically. I wanted the same thing, but more evolving. Uh, John's a pretty busy guy and wasn't always maintaining it super actively. Uh, you know, it did what was needed for most people, but I wanted some tweaks. Uh, and I wanted it to be super usable. I wanted it to be super robust. So, um, you know, no, no bugs in, in corner cases. And, you know, when you combine different commands and things, I wanted them to work as you'd expect. Um, I wanted to develop my own accounting habit that was super important. And I thought by, you know, using the tool that I was hacking on, that would make it more fun and motivating, which um, worked out well, uh, except of course it takes up way more time than you think. But 
uh, I do have a pretty good consistent accounting habit now. I uh, get better at Haskell. Uh, that worked really well. Um, and I wanted to find out if Haskell was good for end-user apps and maintainer productivity. Uh, yes and yes. Those are both, um, I think, overall a win. Um, and this is still in progress. Um, but I wanted to make, again, if you're going to put in all this time, why shouldn't it be something that hopefully lasts? So I was trying to think in terms of a little bit long term. Uh, you know, that's another reason for the documentation focus. And uh, so let's have a quick, uh, this is basically in a nutshell what happened over the last 14 years. First commit, first types, first report uh, was just kind of listing, listing transactions. Then we got the balance report, which is kind of the key feature of um, ledger likes. Let me just see uh, what we have. I think that's a valid journal. Let's see. Yeah, that's a kind of sample journal. So you can see there, that's the kind of listing of transactions. But really what's more useful is the balance report, which sort of lists, you know, accounts and their balances. Uh, we, let me make it a little bigger. This is a sample journal and it's got a bunch of data. This is actually made by Martin Blaze from Bean Counts and I ported it. Um, so H Ledger has uh, multi column balance reports, which is, uh, I think, still kind of unique to more or less unique to H Ledger. I think maybe some of the tools are adding it now, but that's quite useful when you want to see over different time periods. And of course, uh, you can limit by you can show the, the hierarchy. So in this case, this is a top level account. This is a sub account. And then these are other accounts underneath those. And these, these, these totals are kind of, you know, they include the sub accounts. And when that's too much detail, you can kind of limit to depth three or depth two. And of course the numbers are adjusted appropriately. Um, this one has a few too many uh, currencies in it. H Ledger is, of course, multi currency uh, like Ledger was, and uh, like most of these tools are. So, uh, if you wanted less detail, I would just limit it to, say, one of those. So, you get, you get the idea. Um, so, what I wanted to say about that was oh, yeah, so that's the balance support, multi column balance support. Um, uh, this was kind of a, a, a step, uh, a c contribution actually, when I wasn't really hip to Monad transformers. On my Haskell journey, somebody contributed this and made the parser um, stateful, which is useful for the ledger file format, which has quite a few directives and things which require that. Uh, then I added the web interface because um, Yesod was a thing and providing this great library. And I thought, uh, well, that should be relatively easy. Let's do that. And then similarly, when VTY came along, um, I made the curses interface. And uh, I should say probably some of you here, uh, I'm probably relying on your libraries. So I want to say thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Jasper might be one of those, but there's probably a few of you. So because of the incredible library ecosystem in, in Haskell, uh, that made it possible to add some of these things quite quickly, even when I was the pretty much sole developer. Um, but there were occasional big contributions like this. And then uh, over the years, the you know, contributions have been ramping up, which is, which is great. At a certain point, I split from one package to several. And the main reason for that was to ease installation because certain things wouldn't install on Windows. Um, VTY still doesn't work on Windows, unfortunately. And then uh, Yesod, of course, has a bunch of dependencies that the command line tool didn't. And so, especially back in the early days, that was uh, pretty hard to install in the early days of Cabal. So splitting up into smaller packages uh, was a way to 
at least let people install parts of each ledger, even if they couldn't install all of it. Speed just kind of came without trying too hard uh, as GHC got better and as the code got reorganized uh, and then features just have been added incrementally. Um, general currency conversion where you can go from any commodity to any other commodity as long as the information is there uh, is a pretty cool feature. Valuation is something that's, um, you know, pricing things in terms of market prices on any given date. Uh, that's a useful feature too, and is still in progress. Documentation throughout has been just always a, a kind of a big focus. And that's gone through many different forms. Uh, maybe we'll get into some of that. Um, and kind of, uh, yeah, we'll get more into that. Let's, uh, I just wanted to show actually quickly the, see if we can just see a few uh, of those commits. Uh, don't save that. Uh, can we list, let me turn off the limit. Oh, actually, here's one I made earlier. Great. First commit was in, I guess I better save that. 2007, January, and it was basically that. So my early Haskell first application kind of commit was, was this. And I maybe I'd written a bunch of Project Euler scripts, which I'd recommend uh, for, for starting out. But uh, this was a program that ran at the command line. Here is my idea of how the transaction might look, uh, amounts of money, account names. And then uh, next thing was a parser. So a lot of it was parsing because the plain text format requires that. And so just starting with Parsec. And Parsec was another big key ingredient in uh, each ledger existing today because Parsec made it easy to get going with parsing entries like this. And that required a little bit of a data model to uh, represent those things. So uh, basically, we have a journal entry, which has a date and a description and some, I call them transactions then, that was changed later. They're basically line items with an account and amount. And an amount is basically a currency and a quantity. And uh, we basically parse those and show a bunch of basically parse results and that was it. And uh, next thing was basically to print some register type output. And next thing was making it look like ledger. Early on, the goal was to have identical terminal output, which was useful for comparing and knowing that things were correct. And uh, I think a little bit further on, we had the balance report. Uh, so that was kind of when it started being really kind of useful and probably when I started using it. And then uh, I think just, you know, too much to go into here, but we went through the years and we ended up down here. Uh, let's. Let's go back to back on track here. Let's have a look at the code base. Uh, I use Emacs and I use Visual Studio Code right now. And sometimes I use uh, LJ. But for right now, let's use this. So we've got uh, the package directories. It's ledger lib. Everything's down here. In fact, uh, let's look better maybe to look at package. So the data types. Um, types. I, I learned pretty early on that because of cyclic dependency issues with GHC, it's easy to kind of organize things so that your types, most of them at least, are in the bottom. Uh, module, which everything else includes. 
I think that maybe is kind of an anti-pattern, but I think it's very common nevertheless. Uh, originally, I wanted to kind of follow a little bit more of an OO style object oriented where each file would represent a main type and it would have the functions that work on that type. But mostly that doesn't work so well with, with GHC and it's better to have at least major types down here. And so uh, account name is just text. Uh, amount has a commodity symbol and a quantity, which nowadays is uh, decimal from the decimal library, which has worked really well. And it has a few other things which are not so important right now. And then posting is uh, one of these line items right here. This whole thing is a transaction and this is a posting. It's got an account name and an amount. Now here's the transaction which has a date and a description and multiple postings. And we can see this actually visually if I go to pleasure.org contributing and jump to uh, code. Where's code? Here's code. Uh, can I show this bigger? Let's see. Open in a tab. This is, uh, yeah, this is URML. Uh, URML for Haskell. Why not? Um, basically, an amount consists of a commodity, quantity, and optionally can have some price info attached and some display style info. And an amount, a mixed amount, a simple amount is one commodity, a mixed amount is any number of these. So you can have a multi commodity amount. So H ledger, like the like ledger and bean count, it's a kind of general purpose multi commodity calculator and accounting engine. A posting contains a date uh, because postings can actually have an individual date. More usually the transaction has the date and it has an account name and an amount and a transaction has multiple postings. The journal, which is basically the file, contains a list of transactions. Uh, ledger is what I call when you uh, crunch the journal and calculate everything so that you now have a tree of accounts, uh, basically a hierarchy of balances. Okay. Uh, so that we can see here, this is the journal. This has grown quite a lot of extra bookkeeping type info. Um, some of this is parser state, and then others are kind of extra things that are supported by the file format. And here is when you've, here is an account with, uh, with its balance, both the exclusive balance, which excludes sub accounts and the inclusive balance. Um, and just to, again, to show, let's do something a little bit visual. Um, and I should be over here. Let's let your, make that bigger. Did that right. So let's have a look at the UI. In flat mode that's in tree mode let's reduce the depth a little bit so you can see uh, these are the accounts they form a hierarchy uh, because of the colon separated names and um, each one has a balance just which is calculated from the let's look at a smaller one maybe expenses each account has transactions. This, this is the account register. You can see there's a, a each, each transaction amount. And then this is the running total over here. And uh, if I drill in one more with uh, right arrow, this is the actual journal entry. And you can see it, it's posting to this account that we're viewing. It also is 
coming from another account, uh, a credit card in this case. And, uh, you know, as you step through, that's what they look like. So these are the kind of basic reports that that these uh, data structures are supporting. Where's my VS code going? There we go. Um, back to, um, I'm just gonna stop doing full screen. Back to here. So all of that stuff is here under HLedger data. Um, the types we saw, and then each of the major types has a module of its own where the utilities are, so the helpers. Uh, so amount is kind of an important one. So here's where we have basically simple amount and we have, um, that doesn't show it so well, but basically amount uh, arithmetic uh, as much as you can do. You can't do it's not an, it is a num instance, but a, not a f complete one. So you can, it's convenient to do a few arithmetic type things on commoditized amounts, but you can't do everything. Then mixed amount is, is kind of the core type that we use for most calculation inside HLedger. So this is a good one to be familiar with if you're working on it. Currently it's uh, just a, did we change it yet? Let's see. Yeah, in the release version, it's just a list of amounts. And I think in master, it's just been made. Oh, no, it's it's still a, a pull request. Um, we're, I think, going to convert this into a map just for a little bit of extra performance. But the, the types have always been uh, initially at least kind of as simple as I could make them because, you know, I was learning Haskell. I didn't want to confuse myself or, or other contributors. But over time, they are getting a little bit more sophisticated um, with the help of others, mainly for performance reasons and also for, um, you know, uh, just correctness reasons to rule out uh, invalid data. So gradually, we're getting a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, and that's a trade off because you don't want the code to be unapproachable, or I don't. I want it to be uh, easy to contribute to and understandable over the long term. And, and also something that could be read and understood by programmers in other languages or people who want to write a clone of this, uh, even in Haskell. So readability and clarity is, is important, but uh, we are getting a little bit more uh, refined with the types as we go on. So um, this is HLedger data. HLedger read is basically the parsers and that's kind of important to journal reader, um, has journal specific stuff. CSV reader has the, um, and you can read about this in the, in the, in the docs, but basically, uh, H ledger has a special CSV rules format, which is just hints for reading CSV, uh, which is down here. And you can see examples of this, um, like this, so you have a little, if you have some CSV that looks like this, you make a rule, a similarly named rules file, which, uh, you know, has some hints like which fields map to which transaction fields, uh, do we skip a header line? What format is the data in? And then HLedger can just read the CSV directly. Uh, it looks for basic.csv.rules because of this name, and then it'll just function as if it was a journal file. So you can run reports directly from that. Um, here's a more complex one. Here's Amazon rules, a little bit more complex. And here's PayPal, CSV, and some rules which are, so the rules are, I guess that's programming, but they're, they're as simple as I can make it. So um, reasonably quick to learn. And you get your, you know, you can get a pretty good conversion of, of PayPal data and pretty much any CSV data, which has dates and amounts. Um, so that's what that's what these are. And then reports is where we crunch those numbers into um, 
posting support, which is which is. I keep going to that screen, but uh, this is the one that'll do. Posting report is account register, basically. And then uh, I did full screen again, didn't I? Okay, there we go. Balance report is, is as you can imagine, balance report. Multi-balance report is the multi-column variant. Ledger report is, uh, do I have one of those handy? Let's see. That's when you add the budget, budget flag. Uh, uh, let's have a look at this one here. Well, never mind. Uh, Let's look at the docs instead. And uh, one of the goals for docs was to have mnemonic URLs. So hopefully this will just go straight there. Not quite. Okay. Well, it's under balance. And there's uh, budgeting down here. It looks like that. It's basically a balance report with an extra column showing your uh, budgeted amount for that period and that account, and you know how much you actually have spent or, or earned, as it may be. Um, so various reports, and these are um, you would think with plain text, you know, how hard can that be? Um, it's actually not that easy to do it with the flexibility that we're used to with these tools and have all of the options um, and report and modes and possibilities of data um, be robust and uh, interact well with each other. Uh, so this is just to give you an idea of the options of the balance command. These are general options that reply to most commands. Um, so there's quite a lot of things going on here when these interact. So maybe we should just take a quick look at some of that code. Uh, and again, where is my VS code? Right here. Can we have a window? Something. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I see it went away to another screen. Let's get it back. There it is. Let's put that where we were. Uh, so of course those packet those um, submodules correspond to folders, of course, directories in the usual way. So we go to each ledger lib, each ledger uh, reports, and if we look at balance report here, um, that looks. Ledger tests. Here we go. Something like this, it actually uses uh, multi-balance report, which uses this. And that's maybe a little too big. And this this was uh, refactored quite a bit uh, in the past year by Stephen Morgan. We get great work by him, who's been a really prolific contributor in the last uh, few months. So it's uh, actually quite well factored now, um, but it it involves a fair bit of code. Uh, you know, you've got to calculate starting balances for some modes because your report period might not include all of the transactions. And then you've got to figure out which postings go in which column. And then you've got to figure out what changed in each account in each report period. We calculate a kind of a matrix, which, you know, for that table that you saw. 
there's different kinds of modes and uh, here's where we actually are generating the multi-balance report. So each report has a kind of a, a data type representing it. Um, and the idea of this is that uh, you could maybe, you know, share that data in JSON format so that a front end client or an alternate client could render it pretty easily. Um, but we're still calculating the report here. Here's rendering, I think, rendering code while well, generating the rows to be rendered. Sorting, which is a bit tricky when you're in tree mode because you've got to sort each level of the tree independently. Totals, sometimes we want to show percentages rather than absolute numbers. We have a transpose option, which flips the, uh, flips the rows and columns. Uh, which I have never really rarely used, but some people use that. That's So there's some pretty powerful options implemented here. And the goal is that they all kind of work intuitively and they all kind of work together. And whatever combination you make, it either works as you'd expect or it uh, fails gracefully. You know, it, 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 um, it shouldn't give you misleading data. It shouldn't give you an error. It should, it should uh, you know, always kind of do the most sensible thing. Uh, and we're still going here. We're getting into valuation, which is a whole nother layer of converting those numbers into, now I don't think I have prices set up here, but if we had prices, this would, uh, this V flag would convert those into all into my local currency using market prices. Um, so you, you get the idea. Uh, there's a fair bit of reporting code. Uh, and because all of this stuff is pretty intertwingled and pretty delicate, um, even though we have strong types, uh, you need a lot of tests. And that has been a kind of a focus. So we have some uh, we have a bunch of tests. We have um, functional tests which are written using a shell test runner a project that i made uh, again inspired by a, a tool that ledger uses to run their regression tests and it's kind of what what we call golden tests so we have um we have plain text tests like this uh, this is actually the old format but basically a, a command to run and some uh, I guess no sample input in this case, and some expected output and an expected exit status. Uh, here's one where we have input provided, and this is the output. So basically, we have a whole bunch of these. Um, and also, we have uh, unit tests, uh, just using each unit and uh, various test frameworks over the years, uh, currently Tasty. And those look uh, like this. Uh, they're just pretty much standard each unit tests. And I keep them inside the uh, module that they are testing as far as possible. Uh, I used to have them right next to the function being tested because you know the, the idea is to have test code and code under test as close as possible to encourage you to write tests and make it easy to write tests and to maintain tests and to, um, but that was a little bit too distracting when you're trying to understand code. So now I keep the tests at the bottom of the file. And uh, those are collected, nothing too fancy. It's uh, the tests are, for the file are collected under a standard name, uh, named after the module with a tests underscore prefix. So each module exports that, and each parent module aggregates those, uh, like you know, like this. So as we import each submodule, I aggregate all of their tests uh, again named consistently. And so then at the top. Um, 
you know, there's a test underscore h ledger, and then uh, where is that invocated uh, here? Unit test in the test subdirectory. Uh, so here we just call tasty to run. Uh, actually, it runs the CLI test, which in turn import the uh, lib tests. Uh, and and the func tests uh, actually include the unit tests just for convenience. But if I just want to run the unit tests, uh, because they're actually built into the main executable, um, I can just there's a command which runs them. And that's kind of a nice feature, uh, both because it's easy to run them from within GHCI or with uh, GHCID. It's handy. I found having the unit test built in is handy. And if a, if a user is on a strange platform, uh, you know, they can always run that as a kind of a smoke test. And it's a nice thing to see those passing. Um, so, you know, here I'm running, um, I, I use a make file to automate a lot of frequent tasks uh, uh, and just make things easier to remember. Uh, and because there are quite a lot of those, uh, there's a kind of a, a, a pretty cool make uh, help thing built in that I got from the internets. And uh, you can even, if I want to remember how to, uh, you know, do tests, I can give, you know, make help some pattern. Uh, and it'll show me the rules that I should run. Uh, but if I want to see things to do with GHCID, a fantastic tool that everyone should be using. Um, remember that this is the one that runs my tests as well as compiles. Um, so until uh, fairly recently when Haskell Language Server got so good that I could use it on HLedger uh, from VS Code as I'm doing right now. Uh, I use pretty much exclusively uh, this GHCID also running tests. So now if I were to change, uh, you know, introduce a, a compilation error, I would see that or, or if, you know, the test were not passed, I would see that failure. So that's a that's a super useful thing probably you're you're familiar with that but um nowadays of course uh, i've got uh, i've got this pane uh, so that also works this one doesn't run tests but it will at least give compilation errors and as you see super fast so you may not be using actually hlis yet but uh if you're considering it, then uh, I can recommend VS Code as a very easy way to get it started. Uh, fantastic work by everybody working on all of these tools that I'm relying on that have made uh, each measure possible. Uh, so how are we doing for time here? We are doing pretty well. Finish uh, running through utilities. Some interesting stuff in there. Uh, this is uh, useful and worth looking at. I would say um, these are some of these are kind of um, using unsafe perform IO under the hood, just for the purpose of reading the the global debug level, which is. Um, which is basically uh, what is the value of the debug flag. So if I do, uh, let's, let's do something simpler. If I want to see, you know, more, if, if I'm troubleshooting something and I want to see under the hood, I can hit debug that doesn't give much in this case 
it varies by command. So if I increase the level until I do see some more, uh, here's some info about the options that were parsed. And here's some info from the report calculation. And uh, that can be super useful for debugging. And as I increase that, I get increasing levels of detail uh, all the way up to insane level nine, which shows you a huge amount. And that is useful to have. Uh, it means also any uh, user who has an issue, because uh, it's it's pretty easy to get a report that you you don't understand, especially when you start combining flags. Um, and your data is probably bad because it's you know when we have a lot of financial data um, over years um, in plain text, and it's free form. There's a, and you're learning accounting, like most of us aren't expert double entry bookkeepers when we start. Um, it's very easy to have bad data and your reports may not make sense. And then it can be useful to be able to troubleshoot a little bit more this way. Um, for example, if I wanna see why evaluation isn't showing, uh, this, this is quite useful. Let's see. Um, Anyway, you get the idea. And then uh, the H ledger package, which is the command line interface, just adds uh, option parsing. And uh, then each of the commands. Uh, so, so the balance command has a balance uh, module, and it's got it defines the options specific to the balance command. And then, uh, you know, just the kind of command logic and it, it calls to the actual report. So as you saw, the, the report is itself is part of a library because it's reused by all the different interfaces. But this is the stuff that's specific to the command line interface. And uh, probably one of time, but I'd love to get more into the, um, documentation features, which when you hit uh, minus H or uh, dash dash help, you'll see both the command line options plus the manual section for that command. Um, in fact, H ledger itself, if you go help, it'll show the manual for H ledger. Similarly, H ledger UI, uh, I think in this case, I got to do dash dash help uh, or maybe man. Okay, so basically there's a lot of ways to get the manual. It's the same documentation in multiple formats and you can get it as a man page, uh, whether or not you have the man pages installed properly, which in many cases you may not have. Uh, so here I don't, for example, if you're on windows, you probably won't, but you can always run dash dash man and if there is a man executable somewhere on your system, uh, it'll figure it out and you can get a man page. Or uh, if the info executable is available, you can get the info manual, which is much better in some ways uh, because it chunks the information. Um, and if you don't have either, uh, you can get just a pager. Uh, I forget how that works, but it says your help has the info. And similarly then, if you're running a command, uh, say I run info, it'll actually jump to that section of the info manual. Uh, so pretty handy for looking up stuff quickly because there is quite a lot of docs. Um, so that's all, that means that these, these docs are built into uh, the executables. And then they also are rendered for uh, for the website. Uh, so it's it's all the same docs, which uh, is a lot of has been a lot of work to set up and to refine over time, but I think has been quite successful in making it possible for the docs to be complete and, and accurate and available. And uh, that's that's that and then the ui doesn't export much and the web 
it doesn't uh, exports a little bit uh no real reason for that to be exporting stuff but it it just does right now and i think i didn't show that one let me just quickly show that just for completeness uh that just fires up a, a yes so web app uh, runs in the in in the foreground actually so you can see what's going on on your terminal but it automatically opens it in your browser and uh, that sidebar is showing the tree of accounts and their balances we can hide that if we want and then by default we see just everything every transaction all of the accounts it touches but typically you'd be looking at an account register uh, which is just the accounts in in checking and this is just a chart of the checking balance over time we can actually select a part of that to filter it um, and I could jump over to the other account that uh, the expense account that this this transaction went to and then I'd be in the register for the uh, electricity expense account this one here so that's what that's what that looks like it's it's intentionally uh, super simple partly just from time constraints but also because this is supposed to be the UI that your your non-technical uh, housemates or spouse or friends could use if you want to collaborate with them um, so this this is intended to be used by you know non-programmers and, and and to be simple enough that it, it, it isn't too confusing um so i think i've really burned through the time here and maybe it's time for some q a let me just see what else i had here yeah now i was going to get into practical stuff scripting writing pull shooting you saw the debug uh, flag pull requests hmm let me open this up and see. Does anybody have something they'd like to have me speak more about or have a question they'd like to ask? Hey there, uh, I'm Greg. Uh, sorry, I have a very, very concrete question because I use the Ledger technologies a lot, both Hali, each Ledger and original Ledger. Uh, and there is one thing that is that is bothering me, and I didn't find the time yet to to contribute it either to Ledger or how Ledger, Age Ledger, and I will be interested to know how hard it is for for Age Ledger. So, can you go back to the web reports for the web balance sheet because I think it's easiest for me to explain it there. Sure thing. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, exactly, that. exactly. So of course I use the balance sheet a lot. So so I of course I use it in the command line, not in the web version, but it looks very similar to the command line. And and what I wanted to to have, for example, in your here in your example, you have the assets US, and you have more multiple currencies in the assets US. You have VHT, VBMPX, VHCHR, and so on and so on. And when you uh, when you use this in the command line. Uh, and I grab for assets colon US, then the grab doesn't work out right because it's only on one line the name of the the name of the uh, the account. And I didn't find any option to print print it everywhere. But maybe I was just uh, so. So I'm, I'm looking for a balance been... sheet. So I'm so I'm having a balance sheet. Let's just get a balance sheet. Okay. Okay. Uh, and yeah, but one in a one in a format where you have the the categories like assets US. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly this kind of thing. Like and that. here, here for example, the for the E trade for the E trade account, you have all the currencies, but only for the last currency I have the name. So I would like to have the name uh, printed for every currency, so I can grab for it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, this this confuses everybody starting out. Uh, you you know, but maybe somebody who's not seen it before. This E Trade account has a multi commodity balance. It contains all these commodities, and they oops. Uh, this is the old style of rendering them, where there each one gets its own line, and they appear above the name. 
and that's that's confusing and hard to grip for. Uh, so there are a few things to do if you do want to see them all at once. You know, you can't filter and see just this at once and just this, but uh, there is an option to put them all on the same line. Uh, let's see, can I find it? This is a good test for me. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Yeah, but if I put all all on the same line, then I'm I'm sure that there will be a limit. Like after ten currencies, it will say dot 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 or something. Uh, that's true. That that's true in recent releases. Yeah, the old one uh, would show them all, no matter how wide. But currently, we do in line. And, so what what is it you'd like to see? So uh, can you show me the balance sheet again? Yeah. Uh, so I think oh, from oh, a, the, in, in the command line. Okay. Uh, so I think from a from a Unix perspective, it's uh, yeah anything like this from a, from a, from just a, just the perspective that when I I start I started to learn Ledger and I don't want to to write a custom report I don't want to learn all the options the balance sheet is the common concept that an accountant understands and and it would be super good if there were an option. Where, the, where, where you don't try to emulate the UI in the command line. So what I mean by that, if, that, if you go back to the, if you go back to the simple sheet, so the simple balance sheet. Uh, uh, this one? That we just had, yeah, for example, this one here. Uh, mm -hmm. Under E-Trade Gold uh, or, or E-Trade Cash, Maybe we, we, there could be an option which which gives you a balance sheet that is that is Unix compatible in the sense that instead of saying cash, we would say E trade colon cash, and when we have oh. multiple currencies and when we have multiple currencies, we would print the name of the of the account for all the lines, and I think this would be just very good so people can use said and other line processing tools. Yeah, but here I I, I know about this one. Uh, you still want the you still want the hierarchy the tree. Yeah, I still want the hierarchy exactly. Got you. So the tree, but with the full names and and you know filling the name in here. Got yeah, you. because because mm -hmm. then you have something that is super compatible with an old school guy who doesn't want to learn anything new. He just wants to get going in five minutes. Uh, so this was the most missing feature for me when I started using Ledger without learning it. Which may be not a good method, uh, but but yeah, when you are in a hurry, that, that's how we do it, isn't it? That's that's great input. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate that. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, I will definitely note that. Any other questions or remarks, experiences? So, hey, Simon, um, I, I'm actually also the author of one of the tools that is on your very nice plain text accounting page. So first awesome. Thanks Which one, Silvio? Thanks a lot for uh, your community efforts. Um, what, what I'd be curious to, to hear about your perspective is like, where can plain text accounting go further? Like, I, th I, st I still think that, I mean, we're, we're text file based and the tooling is very mature. But I don't think it kind of goes beyond a certain range of users who are very familiar to deal with text editors and um, text file formats. So what would be like the next extension of plain text accounting? Where could we do better or more or be more ergonomic for users? Great, great question, Silvio. Um, I would say the tooling is, is mature in, in a certain niche of functionality that, that we're used to, but there's a huge amount of work that could be done to make it more usable and more powerful. I mean, I think the general, one of the general trends is uh, from like a low level calculator uh, to uh, and more of an accounting construction set to, to a more uh, growing more towards you know, conventional traditional accounting concepts and traditional accounting reports. Um, that's something that H Ledger has tried to bring in a bit more of. Uh, and but there's a, a lot, a long way we could go with that. Um, so as 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 Greg was saying, um, you know, reports that are instantly familiar to to an accountant or or 
or to a user who's just starting out. That's that's been a goal, but it's there's lots more that can be done there. Um, and then there's also just the the polish of the UI and, and more more friendly UIs, um, uh, more graphical things. So uh, particularly for data entry, uh, that's something where a, a, a really slick polished UI is is useful if you're doing manual data entry. And as as you probably know, uh, a lot of you know, not every H Ledger user or plain text accounting user does manual data entry. A lot of us convert it from CSV, but some people do exclusively manual, and especially when you're starting out, manual is is what you're doing. And um, you know, so better better slicker UIs are are definitely another another way to grow. Um, and then I think certainly it's always been my vision to support way more file formats. Uh, inspired by things like pandoc where you know there's this huge matrix of formats you can read and you can write so you can be a kind of universal translator between different financial formats i think um you know i haven't had time to build out too much of those but i think that's something where h ledger could contribute quite a lot in in the way that pandoc has we're, we're well positioned to provide that kind of a, a feature so that even if you don't use plain text accounting, you might use a tool to translate your financial data between apps or between web services. Um, then, of course, uh, right now, stocks and cryptocurrencies are super hot. So there's huge demand for using uh, plain text accounting tools for that. And some of us have been experimenting with that, but it's it's right now um, it's either quite manual and quite a lot of work, at least in the beginning, uh, or it's uh, there is more support by the tool. So Ledger and Beam can support this a bit more, um, but it's quite confusing. So there's great scope for just uh, and this I think is it's not easy, but it's it's part of the challenge is to make these kind of powerful and very flexible reports to make them intuitive and, and you know, just, just easy to understand uh, by default. So um, those are just some ideas off the top of my head of, of areas for growth. Oh, and by the way, which, uh, which is your tool, Silvio, your project? It's at the bottom of the list, it's called Knut. And UT. So, yeah. Oh, super cool. <laughs> it's awesome. written in Go, though. So I had a, a version in Haskell once, but then Go started paying my bills. So I did everything in Go and I kind of started liking it. <laughs> Very cool. I also have some, I'm Nicholas. I also have some, maybe, I don't know, potential feature requests. Or whatever may just be a bit out of scope, but because Maybe Sylvia asked, scope. yeah, Sylvia asked um, uh, like how, how could it perhaps like expand user base or what? So I personally don't actually care at all about plain text accounting, but I really care about um, having this entire like database and functionality of the transactions that I made and the general ledger available to me so that I can batch modify it, especially in Haskell. So those parts I really like. And because of this, I am not a regular H Ledger user. Um, I've only used it for one off task in the past when I had to do specific computations for specific, I don't know, the budgeting of some events or what, but I don't currently use it, for example, for my, um, for my um, Haskell consultancy um, that I use. And for that, what I use currently is um, a kind of like, medium okay tool for double entry accounting, which is a, a QT based tool. It's nice, it runs on Linux, so this part I like. It's not open source and it costs like a hundred Swiss francs, which I don't like so much. And the main problem with that is that some things I just cannot batch modify. It's just not possible. It's not intended for this, but the um, parts that you also mentioned already data entry, that is what I find it's extremely good at and also data display essentially like what I like from the more traditional like Excel style 
tools is just this ability to very quickly display and work on tables of stuff, especially when you have like many entries. I also usually have to do manual entry of stuff, like I don't import things from banks, but I type stuff down from little bills and so on. It's a horrid task, but I have to do it once a year. And um, in there, it's I found it extremely useful if I have a table-based UI where I can very quickly like filter columns, reorder columns, uh, restrict columns, and so on. And I can see the entire data and can quickly spot patterns in them. And I can very quickly, let's say, copy 10 rows or what and just slightly modify them and so on. And these kind of things that like GUI-based table tools are essentially very good at. And so far, I found that there's a like very big gap between this one type of tool, which is basically like Excel, which is like just a dumb table calculation tool. And then the kind of like, um, I can program them text-based, Haskell-based tools, essentially. And there isn't, for me, there isn't really the sweet spot in between yet where I kind of want to do both. And I don't want to be locked into the proprietary tool, but I also want to be able to do this like fast uh, entry task very quickly. So that's where for me, there's like a little bit of a gap. And that's what I, I mean, I personally would really like to see some way how I could use, um, could it replace this existing tools with HLedger, but somehow maintain a similar GUI to it. And maybe you have some ideas about it. I mean, it's like a bigger technical task and maintaining graphical GUIs is also a large time thing. So it may not be readily available, but maybe sometime somebody makes something like VTY or what that just does it for like GUI-based table entry. Like what are your opinions? Great, great ideas. I would love to spend more time on UIs. That's kind of my, my preferred area. And as you say, it's just it costly, it takes time. and. Uh, so um, I forgot to, you, you're right to, to bring up programmable access to your finances uh, through, through a, a nice API. Uh, and we do provide both the HLedger lib API that you can link with and we provide the web API. So um, that is definitely an area for, for growth and exploration and alternate UIs for sure. Um, and you, I like your, your comments about the tabular uh, data. I'll sometimes uh, export CSV out of HLedger and drag it into a spreadsheet so I can do tabular stuff. Uh, and I, I think the tool you're talking about, it's tabular, but it's not a spreadsheet. Is that right? Yeah, it is kind of like a spreadsheet-like editor, but it doesn't have any of the Excel style functionality. I think they use a mm. Qt base, like whatever Qt provides for table entry things. Mm. And then you mm. basically just put things in there and there are just some built-in rules in their code that says if you have things in a certain way. So for example, the, the overall like table of accounts that shows your account summary knows how to sum things up. But even that thing is um, is still... A form of table um, and so they have cool. kind of built in rules into this table thing cool cool yeah i would love to love to hear from people exploring those things and to have more folks uh, exploring those those kind of uis and uh, so if you have any blog posts or chat comments i uh, would love to would love to hear more something which is maybe related and i've been thinking a lot about is actually i mean Plain text accounting files, is it data or is it a program? And I think that makes a lot of difference when you think about developing a UI, right? Because let's say you store everything in a database, it's clearly data. And the nice thing about databases is that every piece of data has its particular ID. So it's very easy to do CRUD on it, right? So you can delete something, you can modify something. But if you look at a plain text accounting file, yeah, it's transactions in the list, but they first of all don't have a unique ID, so it's more at, like more involved to create a UI that actually modifies these text files. And then you can think of certain constructs. For example, um, I've been toying around with a directive that basically does like accrual accounting automatically. So you, you basically just do an annotation on a transaction, and it expands the whole series of transaction in the actual ledger. And that's actually code, right? That's not data anymore. So that's there it becomes much more difficult to take this data and present it in a UI for you to, to play around with and then save it again in the original format. So I think that's a very uh, that's interesting a... distinction that play, plain text accounting has versus kind of traditional GUI tools, for example. 
you're, you're right, Silvio. You, I think you raised two very good points there. Uh, one is that uh, we, we do need the ability to reference, uh, you know, reliably reference individual entries in a, in a free form plain text file um, in order to do CRUD type UIs. And that's the reason that right now in the UIs, you can't edit a single transaction in place. You can only append or you can edit the whole file, but to be able to edit an individual transaction, which we all want to do, um, you need that feature. And it's a little hard to see how to retrofit that on a free form plain text file, but uh, I think it's possible. I, I do have a design for it, just insufficient uh, round to its uh, time so far, but uh, we can totally do that. Yeah. And the other, the other thing you mentioned, uh, slipping my mind, but it'll come to me any second. Um, you were talking about uh, lost it, but it was a good point. But certain direct, maybe it's, it was about directives that expand to other primitive. Transactions. Oh, very good. Yes. Yeah. So, so it, it is a it is a, a little bit of a design choice um, not to have too much programmable stuff in our mm -hmm. at least in our default journal format. Um, for that reason, we I wanted it to be more data-like and more future-proof, and not require and also just human readable mm -hmm. uh, in the default format. Now you, we can easily add a format or a variant format which has more programmability. Um, the downside of the programmability is it's less portable to other tools and it's less future-proof. So you've got to have the tool that can interpret that in order to use mm -hmm. the data. So. Ledger has, for example, um, this value expression language where you can write during complete code inside your journal. And that can be very useful. And a lot of people ask for that. Uh, uh, usually the more specialist niche users, you know, people just doing their accounting don't so much, but um, mm -hmm. the downside of that is, is it's hard to port that and, and support that. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, if you're, you know, if you're trying to be compatible. Uh, well, anyway, there's various pros and cons. So it's a good point you raise. Yeah, yeah I agree. I definitely agree there are trade-offs and, and what you raised is a very good point that compatibility might be one objective of the tool, but it comes at the expense of certain flexibility um, as well. For, for example, mm -hmm. in my tool, I, I really try to exploit this kind of programmability aspect or I'm, I'm trying to. For example, for accruals that where you have basically one expense on a given day, but that should actually smear out to an entire month, right? And you could equally like have it like divided by 30 and have every day the same transaction to really smooth. Oh, I get you. Time. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, for example, a prime example how programmability can make things easier for the accountant instead yeah. of having to yeah. enter like yeah. the transactions all manually. I, I tried to do that myself actually, because I wanted to smooth out some uneven recurring expenses. I wanted to see them uh -huh. on a more smooth. And I, I wrote a little script. So my, my approach has been, well, don't build into the journal format, but write a little add-on command that processes and adds that info. Uh -huh. um, and uh, that's worked well in some cases. So for example, we have this add-on written by um, Petty, uh, whose name I'm just forgetting. Uh, Peter Simons. Hey. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, which is a tool that will, you, you give it uh, rules of what kind of interest uh, regime that your, your, an account is following and it will generate interest transactions which you can then mix into your, your, your data. So we have this concept of kind of manual data but then also generated data and then you can mm -hmm. report on both. But there's pros and cons to that too. Mm -hmm. um, I. I I ran into trouble with the smoothing, so I'll have to look at what you did. Uh, mine, when I started to look at all the general scenarios you could have with real world data, it got confusing. So I, I kind of got stuck on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I just have it implemented as a test and I have one use case so far, which is to split my yearly internet bill into like 12 equal installments, just to see cool. that kind of more smooth on my, on my cool. incomes. Um, There's always a, a tension I find also between doing something useful for your your case and yeah. then doing something that's that's robust that will work in every case that people throw at it. Uh -huh. Usually I'm usually I'm trying to go for the latter and that's that's slower and harder. Yeah, um, I've definitely optimized for the first mm. for the former at the moment. <laughs> 
and there's something to be said for that you know so, you know each ledger i often find i'm frustrated by how slowly some things develop but you know that's just kind of the nature of of, of the, the kind of goals that i have how so um, are you actually still with the original like ledger format is are the, are the tools still interchangeable or is H ledger like a strict superset of what ledger does by now uh, so since the beginning they've been um, quite compatible but not fully compatible um, and we've been diverging a little bit more so in the beginning it was more of a priority to me to be as compatible as possible to you know, allow ledger users to come over either, either to switch or to, you know, just use both tools back and forth, um, mm -hmm. which I've done myself quite often. If, if I didn't understand or didn't trust the reports from one tool, I would run the other tool. And that was very useful to have two independent implementations. Um, there are certain things that, you know, I've chosen not to support so far, maybe ever, um, one of them was the value expression language. Uh, mm -hmm. And the main reason for that, actually, partly what we talked about before, that it, it, there's trade-offs with it. But, but uh, practically uh, speaking, just because it's, it's, very, it's a ton of work to implement that, and you still won't be 100% compatible, um, mm -hmm. because, mainly because it's hard to understand it in the first place. It's not fully specified. Uh, or to, to ascertain that would be a lot of work. But somebody may do it. We have uh, PRs kind of nibbling at that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so back to your main question, uh, there is in the HLedger FAC, there's a, a, a good list of differences in the formats. The, the main issue is the file format. The, the command line interface is similar. There are differences, but that's easy to work around usually. The file format is, um, there is a core that's common that is extremely compatible. So you can have a, a journal file that both tools can read um, mm -hmm. uh, fairly easily if, if you are disciplined about it. It just means you avoid certain constructs that are unique to Ledger. Um, maybe there's a couple that are unique to each Ledger too. And then in the, in the functionality, there's a list of those differences too, um, which uh -huh. you, you may have seen, but... Um, you know, Ledger can do some things that we still can't do, and we can do some things that Ledger can't do. And uh, and then finally, performance. Ledger is still the performance king. Um, it's about 10 times faster on large files. On small files, normal size files, you don't notice it. But uh -huh. if you have to process a million records, a million transactions, uh, Ledger is still a lot faster. And I think uh, I keep coming back to ideas for growth that you asked uh, that's another one uh, there's a lot of room for optimization and i would love to see that the haskell h ledger become come uh, start to compete with ledger on speed um, part of the reason we're slower too is that we're doing a bit more we're checking things uh, a, a bit more thoroughly when it comes to balance assertions and balance assignments uh, we do that a bit more uh, robustly which is costly but <laughs> Um, but still, it would be nice to go faster. Because mm -hmm. right right now, I split my file by year uh, just so that it's quick, but it might be nice to have everything in one file uh, now and then. I mean, but, uh, essentially, all, what yeah. all a ledger like is doing is basically summing up things, right? So when you sum up, do you use like mutable numbers or, you, or do you use like the immutable data structures that, produ that just produce a lot of uh, memory footprint and garbage collection? Essentially, yeah, we're just summing numbers. It sounds really simple and should be super fast. And it's just mm -hmm. plain text, right? But yeah, uh, it uses memory. I mean, last time I checked, Parsing takes about half the time, and calculating the report takes about half the time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's a lot of a ton of memory being slung around. If you look at a report plus RTS minus S, um, you'll see a lot of memory being being uh, accessed. Um, so we are uh, over time. We are beginning in the last year, I would say in particular. Uh, Stephen Morgan again has been doing great work on little optimizations here and there. And uh, every now and then we get a bigger win, which is which is fantastic. But I think we can do still a lot better. Uh, 
uh, each each release of the last half dozen releases, I think, has been faster. Uh, in fact, rarely do we release a slower release. It's been pretty consistently getting slowly improving, but but always moving in the right direction. I think we're kind of getting to that point in time, but I, I have time. But but you let me know, Andreas, uh, how long we should go with discussion. Well, I mean, here. as uh, as long as you have uh, some more time, happy to to go on a bit longer. Uh, I even had a question myself as well uh, on uh, data imports. So I have to admit, I've I've mostly used Bean Point and uh, Bean Count and not. Uh, Edge Ledger so much, but there it has some library support to help you doing custom imports where sort of you do your parsing in Python and then can emit uh, transactions and postings easily. Uh, and it also has a bit of uh, helpers to generate tests for those. So I was wondering what that kind of use case looks like in Edge Ledger. Uh, is it easy to write custom uh, importers for custom formats and also generally do testing of your importers, including CSV? Uh, format files that you mentioned before. I think it is easy uh, just because of the nature of the format that we want to generate is so simple that um, currently our, our sort of normal, what we see is that people, non-programmers or programmers who don't want to get into programming necessarily, uh, they typically will get hold of some CSV from whatever source. Most things export CSV, and they will use the built-in CSV rules to convert that, and that's that's quick and robust and always available with HLedger. You don't need any special programming tools installed. Um, but anything beyond that, uh, including CSV that just is too too gnarly for the rules to support, or non-CSV formats um, like we have people scraping PDFs and that kind of thing. Um, then it seems to be the quick thing to do is just reach for whatever scripting language you know, like Python, and just write your own custom uh, translator and spit out journal format, uh, which is, as you know, just date, description, two lines of postings, and, and that's it. So we don't have, I, I don't think we have special support beyond that. Uh, I mean, you can, if you're a Haskell programmer and, you're, and you import hledger lib, you can very easily construct uh, transactions or any of the HLedger data types. And we do have um, mainly HLedger lib is the API to look at for that. And that is a fairly extensive API which, which, which is growing kind of more usable over time. Uh, so I would recommend if you're interested to, to have a poke at that. So we have this um, page on scripting, which I'll just reference. Uh, which is which is a good place to start, uh, which goes through kind of just like shell aliases, but then getting into uh, beginning to work with your own add-on commands uh, and beginning to work with scripts. Uh, and we have some examples in here, I guess. And these are just little Haskell scripts, which um, import hledger lib. Uh, this one doesn't even do that. What about, oh, here's that smooth thing I was talking about. Um, and these ones are stack scripts because it, it just works well for scripts importing the hledger package. And so pretty much you just import either this, uh, I use this one because I wanted to, to parse the options like hledger does. Or if you're just using the library, you can import that. That's all you need. And then you can, uh, you know, here I'm running a postings report. Uh, and do we have any, anyway, it's, it's pretty easy to make a, make a transaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Sure. I think there are also a few people who have published scripts to convert between all these ledger like. So I think there's a script to convert from bean count to ledger and vice versa. So you could probably use the input, whatever importer you find, and then try to run the equivalent of pandoc in the plain text world to get your uh, desired output. 
Very true, very true. So we've got all these uh, purpose-built scripts which people have released. Uh, and those are definitely worth looking at too. Um, converting from GNU cache is a, is a big one. Um, I'm not sure how, how up to date all of these are, but uh, those are definitely worth, worth checking out if, if it covers one of your use cases. And uh, more, uh, more of these are showing up all the time. So more welcome, all help welcome. Mm -hmm. I thought a couple more about um, uh, some things that I believe would like widen the user base. I mean, this tabular entry is of course one of them, but um, in my experience over the last couple of years, I found that there are a couple of tasks that or accounting tasks that small companies or single person companies or what often have to do that I find are kind of lacking in what you can get so far. You can often get some kind of like web solution for that that does many of those things for you in like a pretty way. But I often find scared of like being locked into that or them just shutting down and figuring out that their startup isn't going to be a unicorn or what. So like one thing is certainly that, that I would like to have in a, as nice GUI as possible and as nice workflow as possible would be a help with batch work of two kinds. One is like you import all your bank stuff and you categorize it accordingly. Like this is very common, right? So for example, you have to say, okay, here I actually spend something or here I earn something, I have to pay taxes or this is just transaction between my, I don't know, visa account and something else. So I don't, it's just transactions between my own stuff. Like very quickly being able to say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no for certain things, for example, that might be kind of a task that um, I think would be awesome. And then other batch tasks are things like um, when I have a, a range of things I have already entered, but I noticed that are wrong. So for example, um, Amazon AWS changed in the past how they did VAT accounting somewhere in middle 2018 or what. So then a common task is to go back, look at all of the bills from AWS and up to this month, file them this way and following from that month, file them another way. And for this, like I have to very quickly filter things, find them, and then also quickly edit them. And that is something that where I have been globally dissatisfied so far of how to do this, both with the tools that um, I already use and the tools that I researched of how I can do that. Um, and then the third thing, I guess, is something that makes double entry accounting easier for people to use in general. Like what I would really like to have is something where I can once define the rule or look up and research how this is to be entered. And then afterwards I can just say, it's a thing like that. And I don't need to remember like six months later how to do that. So for example, I, can, I would like to have something that where I can just say, well, I bought a software package or I bought a software as a service thing, file it for me. And then it suggests like, what should be the two accounts involved with that, for example, or even more complex things. For example, if I'm a contractor and I write an invoice to somebody in December, but they pay it only in January or February, then there are special rules in different countries of how it has to go into the accounting, like it has to go into special accounts and then be moved at the beginning or end of the next year and so on. And this stuff that I can never remember longer than two weeks. So each time, each year I look up, okay, how is it supposed to be done? And then I do it this way. And then next year I have to do it again. It would be really awesome if I could just say, instead of like directly doing the, the entry to the corresponding accounts, if I can just kind of express the intent or have some kind of drop down list of suggestions of commonly done things. And it said, ah, oh, yeah, this is how you file stuff like this. This is probably what you want. Those are kind of the three top favorites of what, what I find is lacking. That last one is probably the number one most useful thing that uh, we could provide for for real world users is just a, just a nice curated uh, list of entries, journal entries for real world situations. Yeah. Um, just, you know, that's a, an easy and obvious thing to do. It's just it's slow and, and work and tedious. And so it hasn't been done in, in a nice way, but that would be super useful. Uh, and also, I think those of us, once you've been doing it for a while, you end up just going back to your last time you did it, you search back and you copy paste, and then you no longer have quite the motivation for it. But 
it's especially important for for new folks um and also for as you say things you're doing infrequently um one of the things i still struggle with is tax filing which here in the us is is complicated and that was one of the big wins for me of using plain text accounting is having trustworthy numbers for those those tax forms um but still uh, i would love to find ways to make that easier and i think uh that's the other thing that goes with the journal entries is the choice of accounts. That's that's the big a big part of the work of setting up for plain text accounting is getting your right chart of accounts that both tells you the information you need uh, and including the information you need for for tax forms. So one of the big tips there, which which I didn't follow in the beginning, is to organize your accounts according to how the tax authority wants to see them. Uh, and maybe in other countries this isn't such a, an issue because you have same tax systems and it's done for you. But um, yeah, I agree. I agree with those things. And what was the first thing that you mentioned? So the, the first one was like, in terms of your two batch work tasks, one was to review oh, and right. categorize global. imported stuff. Like global global changes over all your data. And, yeah, that was, the, I a, mean, the first one was review and categorize. So like you import and then you classify, right? And oh, then right. the second one was the thing with yeah. like changing the tax mm. rate for all the AWS stuff, for example, these kind of like batch work where I, I don't want to go to like the individual places. I want to super quickly say, like, mm. find me all my payments to AWS. I now need to change the tax rate for those, right? Right. And you'd like to do it through the UI in a more structured way and not, not just search and replace in the text file. Yeah, I'd, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and mm. ideally I would mm. like to, uh, I would like to do it in the fastest way possible essentially, but often like, like, I mean, you could write a script for example, but sometimes it's not worth it. Right. It's, I found especially yeah. that when I have something that I pay monthly and I have to do it for the last year, it's much faster to just find it in the, in a table and quickly edit it with like control C, control V, then yeah, to like yeah. conjure up the script, even if this is something that you do mm. regularly, if the data is sufficiently small, mm -hmm. doing it in the GUI can, can be much faster. Yeah. So that'll, that'll come when we have that, that, that layer of, of, you know, being able to address individual entries reliably yeah. in the file. And that'll, that'll unlock all of that stuff, which, which will be another step forward in, in usability. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there and are some also, tools. There yeah. are some tools for inter interactive uh, categorization. Uh, I think they're terminal based, but there's a couple of them on plaintextaccounting.org. Not yet a super slick one, but but there are a few projects in that direction. I think in the bean count uh, side, at least, there is also a web UI called Fava, which um, I haven't used extensively for that purpose. But uh, at least once I was able to edit um, an expense account in, in one transaction through the UI. So at least for simple use cases, I think it works. Maybe that would even, I, I don't know, maybe that might even work on, on HLHR files as well due to the formats being similar. Well, I've been telling people for a few years actually that they should totally use Fava with HLHR just by running it through a Ledger to Beam count, uh, which is another great tool for converting. And it should be possible to automate that. So you have a command that opens up your thing in Fava, uh, at least for reading reports and things, because I hear Fava is really great. I haven't seen it just recently. But um, yeah, that's that's cool that they show that how that can be done. And they seem to be the leading UI in terms of, um, in the PTA world, Fava is is where it's at with, with UI right now. So we should definitely in the Haskell world, the H Ledger world, we should make it easy for that to be able to be used. And or we should upgrade our own web UI and or add new web UIs to to kind of be competitive and be as good as or better. Because, um, you know, Haskell is supposed to be good for building large applications and it's supposed to be productive. And um, I guess uh, I think it just needs a few more people. Um, and that'll that'll be apparent. Either I'm slow, or it's just I've had a lot to do because uh, we don't have all the things I want yet, all the nice things. But uh, they're coming, hopefully. All right, awesome. Um, 
I want to be conscious of your time as well. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. That was that was a great talk and a great dive into the code base and uh, great to see the, the history of the project and the architecture as well and uh, also wonderful Q&A. Thank you very much. It was a bit of a dive, uh, but I hope I hope interesting. And I, I thank you all for listening and the, and the input and uh, thanks for inviting me. Hope to see you. Um, let me show you my last slide. I should remember that because this is something easy to forget. So I've been leading and doing most of the heavy lifting on this project. There have been a ton of contributors. These are just the committers. There have also been people who have given input. So that's just a quick, a quick uh, mention of those, not to mention the library authors and two authors. And so you know how, how it is. Everything is sort of building on the shoulders of others. And uh, hope to see some of you in the, in the chat, hledger.org slash hash help. Thanks, folks. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. All the best. Thanks.